Well, hey guys, uh, wanted to do a follow-up video on confessionalism, and um, oh, and this is uh, yes, this is a new mic. Uh, I well, it's not new actually. I've had this for about three years. I bought this for Priscilla for some recording, and we never took it out of the box. It just stayed on the shelf. And so some of y'all mentioned you couldn't hear the the videos I've been making very well. Uh, the audio was bad. I'm, I mean, I'm recording straight off my phone. And um, and so I remember to have this, set it up, and uh, hopefully hopefully the audio quality uh, is improved. Um, but I wanted to talk about the New Hampshire, uh, 1833 New Hampshire Confession of Faith uh, for a minute. Uh, those of y'all that are from the church know we're, we're trying to assess this statement of faith, looking over it for uh, the next two weeks. We're voting in two weeks uh, to adopt this as our church confession of faith. Um, the elders, from, from the beginning, and 11 years ago, the elders have been affirming and, and holding to kind of preaching and teaching consistently uh, with an, a little bit of a adopted um, the, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And, and and so that that's our elder statement of faith. It, it's it's narrow. It's it's a lot more reformed uh, than we wanted for a whole church statement of faith. And so um, this is much simpler. The the New Hampshire is much simpler, um, and, and it's broader in, theologically in terms of what it allows. Whereas the the London Baptist is a is a more narrow baptistic statement, and. Um, but some of y'all had some questions about a few things on this statement. I wanted to try to clarify those uh, in this video quickly. Um, like all statements of faith, this one starts out the same. Uh, like all great statements of faith, it starts out the same, uh, really affirming the supremacy of Scripture, the, uh, the preeminence of Scripture above all other things. Um, and, and so this statement of faith does that. And then I think the real... You know, if I had to narrow down the real strength of this particular statement of faith, uh, this this confession, it would be the gospel centrality, uh, the richness and and really the clarity of the gospel uh, that is presented in this particular confession is is impressive. Um, and that's why we're not trying to write our own, but we wanted to find this historical one because we're not going to improve on this. And so. Um, so the the gospels articulated in articles uh, two through nine, uh, very rich, and then one through five really begin to lay the foundation for the gospel in the character of God, uh, the fallenness and depravity of man, the salvific work of Christ, specifically his uh, justification and that doctrine, and, and and the imputed righteousness of Christ. So really, really foundational doctrines that we uh, love. And, and then it gets into biblical conversion in Articles 6 through 9. I think balance, give a really healthy balance that, that we want as a church um, and, and as Christians, I think, because it's the balance that the Bible gives. So, you know, when it talks about in Article 7, regeneration or, or what it means to be born again, um, it doesn't stop there, but it says this regeneration consists in giving of a holy disposition of the mind that is affected in a manner above all comprehension by the power of the Holy Spirit in connection with divine truth. So as to listen, secure our voluntary obedience to the gospel, which results in holy fruits of repentance and faith and newness of life. So, it secures the, the power of the Spirit comes in regeneration. We're born again, and it secures our voluntary obedience to the gospel. So there should be a volitional choice to obey the gospel, to believe the gospel, to repent of sin, to follow Christ. That volitional choice matters from the will. And it is a fruit, an immediate fruit of regeneration. I, I, I love uh, the, the clarity that brings. And then number six, the freeness of salvation. It says all uh, by the gospel uh, have the immediate duty uh, to accept the gospel with repentance and faith. And then listen to this, that nothing prevents the salvation of the greatest sinner on earth, but his own inherent depravity and voluntary rejection of the gospel. So if someone were, if someone is not saved, it is because they have rejected the gospel. Inher their inherent depravity and voluntary rejection of the gospel. 
Uh, not merely that they were not chosen for salvation, but that they rejected out of their own uh, stubborn depravity of will. Uh, that is a balancing biblical statement. Um, the Gospel of John gets into that a lot, and this, this confession uh, brings it out. Number nine, it may sound a little bit redundant, but it's not. I, I think it's very clarifying regarding true conversion. It says, we believe that election is the eternal purpose of God, according to which he graciously regenerates, sanctifies, and saves sinners, that being perfectly consistent with the free agency of man. It comprehends all the means and connections with the end. So the free agency of man is consistent with regeneration and God's sovereign salvation. So again, I mean, this is just, it's putting in simpler terms passages like John 3, where Jesus says, you must be born again. Or you will not make it into heaven. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven, Nicodemus, unless you are born again. And being born again is something the Spirit of God does according to his will. And then in that same conversation, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that whoever believes. right? And he tells Nicodemus, you need to believe. You have a responsibility to believe if you're going to be saved. And so those two things are not in conflict with each other. Those are biblical tensions. And this confession uh, keeps those tensions alive and brings clarity to them. Uh, number 12 and 13, articles 12 and 13, get into the, the harmony of the law and the gospel. Um, and it affirms the gospel first. The law of God is the eternal and changeable rule of his moral government that is holy, just, and good. So the law is good. Paul says that repeatedly in, in Romans and other epistles. And then it guards against abuses. So in Article 13, it says, the, it talks about the new covenant. The new covenant has been established through the redemptive, redemptive work of Christ and that Christ has fulfilled the old covenant, therefore making the old covenant obsolete. So when Christ fulfilled the, the old covenant, he made the old covenant obsolete and then ushered in the new covenant. And that's language specifically taken. I mean, that's a quote taken from Hebrews 8.13. That's a rich chapter regarding the law and Christ's fulfillment of the law. And so it's guarding against a type of antinomianism, this type of lawlessness. And then it's also guarding against those who would, you know, whether knowing or unknowingly, uh, be trying to take the church back to the shadows, take, uh, take us back to the old covenant when Christ has already fulfilled the old covenant and, 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 and they want to take us back into a form of Judaism. So it guards from that. Um, now, 14 and 15 on the gospel church uh, really begins to talk about the ordinances. And anybody who knows me knows I love uh, the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper as uh, identifiers of the local church. Um, I, I think that's how the Bible lays them out. And this statement uh, talks about the gospel ordinances as identifiers, visible identifiers of who are a part of the local church. Um, and then number 16 on the Christian Sabbath. This one I wanted to clarify, and I think there was some confusion among a few of you. Um, really what we like about this is the broadness of it. It's not narrow. Um, it says, we believe that the first day of the week, that's Sunday, is the Lord's day or a Christian Sabbath. So the Lord's day or a Christian Sabbath. And, and, and just to distinguish here, not a Saturday Sabbath like the Jews. The Jews kept a Saturday Sabbath. That's a different, that's under the old covenant. That's a, according to the law. That's a different thing. This statement is talking about a Christian Sabbath, which would be on Sunday or a Lord, the Lord's day. And I may do a video on that, kind of unpacking that more, but to put it in really simple, quick terms, um, some believe that the Sabbath uh, was fulfilled by Christ, but that uh, not because of the Mosaic law, that was fulfilled by Christ, but because of the creation um, pattern set by God where he worked six days and rested on the seventh, that that principle is still binding on Christians because it supersedes the law of Moses that Christ fulfilled. And so Christians should still keep a Sabbath 
uh, because of the creation pattern, not because of the law of Moses. And that would be a Christian Sabbath view. And then, uh, then there would be a Lord's Day view. And that would be that the, the Sabbath was entirely fulfilled by Christ, uh, according to Hebrews and, other, and some other passages. And what we have now is the first day of the week, Christians gathering to worship Christ on the day of the resurrection as the early church did. And there's all these passages in the New Testament that show the church began to worship the Lord on the, on the Lord's day and that the Sabbath is no longer mentioned, uh, they would say. As, as being significant. And Romans 14 is a big deal here. Uh, Romans 14, 5, it says one person esteems one day is more significant than another and another day, and while another esteems all days alike. And so Paul seems to kind of treat this Sabbath day uh, issue with some uh, freedom of conscience. And, and so I like this statement because it, it seems to do that as well. Um, and then lastly, uh, 17 on the family. Uh, we actually added that. This is not in the New Hampshire Statement of Faith. So uh, what we are going to put before the church and our church on uh, in two Sundays is a, is a extra little uh, section there on, on the family, which gets into gender roles and sexuality and marriage and, and gender identity, all these cultural things that we want to guard against because the scripture has spoken clearly about them. And so there's a statement on the family there and and, and getting into sexuality as well. Um, and then lastly, on eschatology, uh, number 19 and 20, um, allow for room for differing eschatological positions or end time uh, views, uh, just as long as we affirm the visible coming of Christ, uh, that he is the judge of the living and the dead, and that there is an eternal heaven and hell. Uh, so, Great statement of faith, great historical statement of faith, baptistic, um, helpful, clear, and, and very gospel-centered. Uh, I would commend it to you as a great historical confession.